Hey everyone, it's Rachel. You're listening to the Misfortune Cookies podcast. Today, Carl interviews Anthony, who shares about his experience with depression and suicidal ideation. This episode does contain a discussion about suicidal thoughts, so please do what you need to take care of yourself, whether that means skipping this episode or something else. We also share some resources in the description for anyone who might be currently in a crisis. Thanks again for tuning in, and here's Anthony's story. Hey, Anthony. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here today. Hey, Carl. Thank you for having me, and I appreciate you inviting me to uh, Miss Fortune Cookie. Yeah, absolutely. Can you share with the audience a bit about your background, where you're born, what your family is like? Sure. I was raised in New York City, so I grew up most of my life here. My parents immigrated here in the 1980s from China, and they had my sister, older sister, who is a year and a half older than me, and then they had me. So I grew up in New York City. I grew up in a neighborhood that Mm -hmm. is featured in an amazing movie called Coming to America with Eddie Murphy. (laughs) We had a very diverse neighborhood. We had a mix of about 70 cultures, 70 countries or nations around my neighborhood. So like we have Filipino places here. We have like amazing Chinese food. So I grew up most of my life in New York City. I went to school here. I went to college here. So born and raised as a New Yorker and now... I work for a food data company that does a lot of foresight in terms of the food industry, seeing what trends in the market in terms of what people are buying, what people are eating, how farmers are doing in in terms of the agriculture sector in our country. So that's my job currently. I majored in history and Asian studies, and I'm very passionate about sports. Big fan of the Indiana Pacers, the New York Mets, the Indianapolis Colts. That's a little bit about myself for the audience to know. Well, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think it's important for audience to to know you a little bit. And I know that the story that you want to share today is a little heavy, but I'm really grateful that you're willing to talk about some of this. So maybe the first question I have is really just when did you begin to experience depression and, and some of these thoughts and feelings? I think for me, when I experienced depression or I, I was I was at a very young age, I think. Nine eleven happened when I was in middle school and that changed a lot of New Yorkers' lives because, you know, you just growing up you you, you never kind of saw death closer than that. Going to school, I would always see the World Trade Center from my window. And for that period of time not seeing it, for me as a middle school kid, you never experienced death fully until I think at that time and age when you just saw thousands of people's lives disappear in an instant and it's just visible on TV and it's not like far away. At that age, those things were heavy and I didn't have anyone to process with. As a child, I don't think I was emotionally mature at that point to wrestle with the whole idea of life or death. So I think there was a deep sadness and you didn't know how to respond to it. And then compounding that, I remember losing a middle school teacher a year later and finding out he was gunned down in Harlem. And that was that was hard for me as a kid. I had no one to process that with. Mm. And there was a lot of grief. You know, I, I felt this immense sadness. And I think I remember like it was just really dark for me for a bit in middle school. I didn't know what was going on. I think what I wrote Mm. in poetry or what I did in terms of art, it was just dark and sad. It gets a little heavier because like growing up in in New York, there there are definitely things that I had to experience, like getting jumped in middle school by like high schoolers, having your friend beat up by high schoolers. Those things like were traumatic. I had a lot of early trauma that you, you didn't get to process and then you as you get older, you, you forget this like baggage in the background and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to get through life. It resurfaces and it gets re-triggered by things in the, in the present. I think going to high school, for me, it was just, um, you know, awkward Chinese kid bullied for a good part of middle school. And you're trying to figure out like, who am I? Where, where am I going? What is life all about? Because I lost a teacher that I admire. And at that point in, in my life, one of my closest family relatives and my caretaker for most of my childhood, my grandmother was sick and dying of cancer. You know, she eventually passed. 
it was the hardest part of uh, my high school years. Like it was like trauma, trauma, trauma. You you throw in more trauma. You don't you don't have anyone to walk you through it or anyone like talk you through it. My parents have this mentality of eventually it works out. They don't have this thing where like, oh, let's talk about it or anything. There was never a dynamic where they would just listen to what was going on.、Mm. So for me, it was just like. Anthony, figure it out. Anthony, you will find a way. But that puts a lot of weight on a, on me and on like if you thought of it yourself, like oh, I'm I have to figure it out. And as a child of a second generation immigrant family, my parents worked ten nine hours, so they didn't have time to kind of emotionally invest in their children. More more so,、yeah. they they financially was investing in our well being, buying the clothes on our、right. backs, buying food, the bare bone essentials of a typical Chinese immigrant family. Growing up in New York, there was no time for investing emotionally in a child. Yeah,、um, and I saw it evidently in my parents because my dad worked long hours. I would never see him. So what ends up happening is I he would be asleep when I get to school. He would be at work when I come back anyway. So I would never see him from dusk till dawn. Throughout all of high school and middle school, Mid- yeah,、or? high school, middle school, because he worked in a restaurant. My mom, fortunately, I would see because she owned the shop, but she ha- hardly had time for us because she worked seven days a week at that point. So the only interaction I have was showing my report card, just telling them like, "Hey, I'm doing well in school. Look at my report card. That's it." So bare bones, my <laughs> parents、good. knew like I was succeeding in school. So success wise in school, you're like. Oh, Anthony's doing fine emotionally and everything. So that that was hard.、Uh, I think going through high school, you're trying to figure out who you are. You're figuring out like your worth. And so I try to find my worth in people, in certain things that I didn't have an understanding. So like my kind of way of venting or escaping was like through video games at that point. You know, emotionally, I could just rage and destroy things or whatever. But that was the only escape. But at, at some point, escaping to video games gets to a point where you just can't deal with it anymore, and then the emotions get very heavy. Yeah. So for me, I didn't make any friends in my freshman year of high school. It was just hard for me to make friends. The suicidal ideation came my freshman year in high school. I didn't want to be here anymore because I didn't have any close friends. I didn't. I don't even know how to talk to anyone. What kind of thoughts did you have towards yourself? The thoughts that I have about myself was like, "Well, you didn't make it in life. You're not worth much." I mean, if I if I didn't do well in school, my parents thought I was like,、um, you know, a piece of roast pork. <laughs> that was their line. They would say like, "Your your life is worth less than roast pork," which is like in Cantonese, it means you didn't make much out of your life. How does it sound in Cantonese? Sangga chasu hoga sangde. So it, it's pretty much saying, I would rather have given birth to roast pork than have given birth to you. Which sounds like the roast、wow. pork is worth it because it will feed me and keep me full, as opposed to you. You're、mm. not worth much.、Um, there are moments where you're questioning who you are. I don't have friends, so no one's gonna miss me if I go. The option was just to end it all, but. Like as a high school student, like I'm like, how do you do it? What what do you do? Like, I still had dial up internet. You don't have the mentality like, oh, let me research how to end my life or whatever.、Um, that's how it started. I mean, eventually, you know, for me, I found Christianity and in some capacity helped me in in healing a part of my life. And it was hard because like for for a guy becoming a Christian from a totally different background that wasn't like. Uh, my parents are not Christian. They never went to church. Maybe Christianity was a way of also helping me deal with these things, dealing with my depression, dealing with like, you know, my suicidal ideation. Because like, it seemed like Christian had a way of dealing with this stuff.、Um, mm-hmm. I was wrong in some sense because going to church, youth group, and everything. There was not many people at that age who have experienced X amount of trauma. Who experienced like bullying and experienced all these other things, and there was no outlet for me to kind of feel safe to express what was going on in my life, like other role models, maybe. Yeah, I remember the first time expressing to my youth pastor at that point, I'm having these thoughts about ending my life. It's slowly coming back, and I don't know what to do about it. Like, what what do I do? And I really just don't want to be here. I wrote an email, long extended email. Maybe grammatically, looking back, it was like incorrectly phrased. But 
I think I remember him saying, oh, it's selfish for you for thinking of these things. Uh, you know, why don't you think of your family, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, at that point, I kind of froze up because I was like, oh, I guess it's selfish to think like taking your own life and all that stuff. I was made fun of for opening up to people at my church at some points. And, you know, at that point, I just froze and closed myself off from people. And I didn't feel like sharing with anyone or expressing, mm -hmm. you know, because as a kid who newly came to Christianity, because you just, you just want to feel like you belong somewhere, but you also want to feel safe that you could share about what you're going through as a kid. Mm -hmm. I think now maybe I would have stood up for myself, but like back then, no, I'm scared. Mm -hmm socially awkward you right. didn't know what to do at that point you just took it as it is because you believe as a chinese person you believe anyone who's older than you had much more wisdom you know respecting your elders and whatever um so take me back to that moment though when when you sent that email to your youth mm -hmm. pastor and he responded that it would be selfish to continue to harbor these thoughts yeah. how did that hit you i think looking back i mean i still have that email i think but I definitely remembered this feeling of guilt because like being Christian, having these thoughts is sinful and wanting to do these things is like being selfish. I'm not thinking of the other people. Um, I think I felt a lot of shame. I felt, felt a lot of guilt and I just disregard it and push it away. I'm just going to truck along and deal with it. So I, I went through high school, went through college dealing with a lot of trauma. There was a lot of death, people dying in my life and Ever since 06, there was never a break in between where someone close didn't pass away. It was never catching a break where I could just sit in the, the sadness and just sit in it. It was just like, oh, so-and-so died. You need to move on quickly because you have something else you need to take care of. It wasn't like, oh, Anthony, normal grieving process. You, you have time to just grieve the loss of so-and-so or there wasn't that time and you know. It sounds like there was just no permission to grieve. Yeah, there wasn't. Or either, either that or, you know, there was no one to, to sit there with me to be like, it's okay, you know, or something. Or, or no, no hug or whatever. There was nothing. I mean, I didn't tell anyone about it either. But that's the hard part because at that age, you didn't know how to tell people. There was no, like, social media now where everyone can just write oh, I lost this person or whatever. I think in the early days of Facebook, expressing your sadness or anything on Facebook seemed like you're just seeking attention, you know? There's no safe or perfect place for me to share. And so I had this mentality like, I'll figure it out or I'll get through this on my own strength. I would fall into this deep, dark hole and I wouldn't have anyone able to get me out. And so I definitely had moments where I didn't talk to anyone for a while. It seemed like everything in life was going all right in my life. But deep down, I was just like dying inside. So, um, yeah, it take me closer to the last two years, because I know that there was an incident that you wanted to share in 2018, 2019. Walk me through some of that and how some of these intense feelings of loneliness came to a head. So about two years ago, I worked for a uh, organization that I was very passionate about, but it was my first job out of college. I spent most of my life working with this organization. And when it came to an end, for me, it was hard. You know, it was like a baby to me. I worked for a nonprofit, a Christian nonprofit, and that was my life. I felt this was my passion and this was something I wanted to do for the rest of my life, but... The organization went on a different direction and the aftermath of all that left a lot of scars, a lot of PTSD. And I didn't know what to do after this because you spent a good chunk of my post-college life serving something that you were gung-ho about. And then it just gets swept up and taken away from you. And you're like, well, now what? What do I do? Because I could have spent that time going to med school or I could have spent it doing all, like a whole bunch of other things, right? But... That was all gone. And being unemployed and not finding a job for, for a year, you felt very worthless about yourself. I, I was at a point where all those feelings from the past, all those past hurts, traumas, um, I call them demons, 
uh, come back, come roaring back because I was like 25, jobless. Your parents are on your back about like, why haven't you found a job? You made the wrong choices in life because you chose what you're passionate about, what you love. You know, that's the American dream. You follow your passions. You do what you love, right? And then what happens when you crash and burn? No one prepares you for that. College doesn't prepare for when you, everything burns up in your face. I remember I sat in my room and, you know, I didn't know what to do with the rest of my life because it seemed there was no future. There was nothing. There was no path forward at one point. You know, I applied for many jobs tried out for interviews you, you keep your head up above water for a while i have some savings i'm gonna find a job you don't find it my first six months and you're like kind of stuck and then at some point in 2017 into 2018 i thought about ending my life because it was just not worth it anymore because like there's nothing it felt like there was nothing holding me back from just doing it and so 2018 was kind of this very dark period of like even faith-wise i didn't go to church i didn't talk to most people about what was going on because it was just dark 2018 and for me it was like having your identity stolen feels like everything around you is like crumbling before you like when it rains it pours and like for me it was like it rains it pours and then you throw in a hurricane after the hurricane a, a flock of birds decide to poop on your head <laughs> and, <laughs> because they just wanted to so first half was like shit and then at, at some point in 2018 i got a job thank god i got a job i think for me i was like oh dang this is it you know this is the breakthrough i'm looking for you know a job <laughs> all my security all my all my things was like this job will lead to another job eventually i started working for for the city it was through americorps and the experience itself was amazing. I think I, I thought this was like, it's going to lead to a, a secure job, full-time job, and everything's going to be okay. You know, I'm going to be have smooth sailing from here, right? Mm -hmm. You know, this was like an answer to a prayer. This was like, maybe, maybe this is it. Yeah. How did you end up finding that, that job just out of curiosity? I found that job because one of my friends, he was like, hey, you know, there's this opportunity. I think this would be a good fit for you to work for the government there's a chance, like 60%, there's a vacancy that will hire you. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to apply for this thing. I was sitting at a Popeye's doing the application and then having a friend look it over <laughs> at a Popeye's. <laughs> I still remember I was like eating wings at that point. And I was like, yo, I'm going to apply for this thing. If I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. Um, I got it. And then I had an interview with this agency, with this office and everything. At some point during this interview, the people who were interviewing questioned my citizenship. It was hilarious. Whoa. They're like, didn't you have like an issue with your, with your citizenship, your visa and everything? I was like, uh, I'm an American citizen. And, um, no. And I was like, I think I, I was born here. I mean, I have a passport. It yeah. was, it was the weirdest interview I had, but looking back, I was like, okay, I have this new job. I have this new opportunity. You know, eventually, you know, a lot of other good things happen in between. I started working in November, and so I got to celebrate Thanksgiving with these new coworkers who didn't know who I was. But it was amazing. And eventually, during that time, I started seeing someone for a bit. And then that led, in January, to getting into a relationship. And I thought everything was going to be dandy, and everything was going to be smooth sailing at that point. Getting into a relationship with someone, you know, first time having a girlfriend. It was like, okay, it seems like everything is going all right. But in the back of my mind, from all the years of having a lot of shit happen, I was like, yo, shit's going to happen. <laughs> shit's going to hit the fan. And then it's going to be a lot of shit. So for me, it's just like, how long is the good things going to last? Because there's always a lot of bad stuff happening. How long is the good things going to last? So you always had this anxiety in the background? Yeah. So what happened next? You got this job and you started seeing this person. Walk me through how the shit hit the fan. So job was not long term. It was contracted. So my job ended at the end of June. I was like, I have a good chance of getting another job because I have this experience now. And people saw how hard I work and people can vouch for me from this office and they could give me letters of referral. And it wasn't just like, you know, some nonprofit that I worked for, but I had legit strong referrals. And so 
started job searching, no luck, first couple of months. And then eventually, through that process, me and my girlfriend broke up. And at that point, I thought I could navigate through, one, losing your job, and then having a breakup. But I was completely wrong because, like, for me, I was like, I've been through a lot, so I can handle this, right? But the emotions and also the the things that came storming right after didn't prepare me for what came next because it was a slow buildup of things. Like Sisyphus rolling up a stone and then the stone coming back and hitting you in the face and then you just crushed and then now you have to figure out how to push the stone back. Why did you guys break up? Or how did how did you guys break up? Well, it was a long conversation. My my girlfriend at that time felt that we were different and so didn't see a future for us. And so I decided to end it. I, I cared a lot about her and I still do. And I always wanted her to be happy regardless of uh, who she was with. And I think if she wasn't happy being with me right now, then long term, it would not be right for her to stay. And so... I thought that was the right thing to do, even Mm. though it was going to hurt me a lot, a lot. Um, Yeah, but sounds like you made the surgery cut on yourself. Yeah. (laughs) In some ways. Yeah, I pretty much ripped out my heart and just like crushed it. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And it was hard. I don't think I enjoyed it much. And then going to the summer, trying to figure mm-hmm. out a lot of stuff. You throw in more stuff piling on. My grandmother's health is not doing well. You throw in a bunch of other things and slowly compounds and compounds and compounds. And at some point, all my past comes roaring back. And, and that moment in the summer, what I thought was a turning point, wasn't a turning point. What I wanted to do and what I wanted to be didn't turn out to be what I wanted to do. And I also found out that year, a friend of mine lost his brother to suicide. And I knew his brother, he cared a lot about his brother. And for me, it was like, what's stopping me? You know, what's preventing me, holding me back? From also taking your own life? Yeah, you rationalize these things like, well, you know, A, B, C, D. And it seemed like, Mm. okay, it could work out. And then I thought about my friends and I was like, well... They probably can work it out if I'm gone. I was preparing for a reality where I wasn't going to be there for them or be there at all. Rationally, X, Y, and Z. These are the things. And So it's very logical, your suicidal contemplation. Yeah, for me, it was like calculated, mathematic. I, I rationalized it as like, I had a niece and nephew at that point. I was like, they're young. They won't remember me. So that's okay. I think the hardest people who will be hit would be my parents and my sister. But for my friends, I was like, ah, oh, they're not going to, it's not going to hit them hard. Probably not as hard. But, you know, that's my thinking at that point. And so I was seeing a coworker who was also a therapist and stuff. And um, at some point she kind of realized I, I was planning something. And so she, caringly enough, was like, I am not going to let you leave the office until you get help because it seems you have prepared for something prepare for a reality where you're not here and i don't want that for you and i was like well what are the options like i want you to get help i never want to go to a hospital i never want to go kind of sit sit in an er room (laughs) which ended up happening i ended up being driven to the er and once you tell the nurse like oh i want to you know my friend wants to kill himself they just rush you through because you know (laughs) they just don't want you to die did your colleague go with you No, a friend of mine came with me. Uh, She stopped by my colleague's office and she went with me. Um, I remember, scariest part, I was like, I didn't tell my parents. I I kind of lied to my parents. I was like, I'm sleeping over at my friend's house. (laughs) You know, there was just a lot of shame. I'm not going to tell my parents. Like, I'm in the hospital. Why are you in the hospital? You seem healthy. We saw you early in the morning. Like, you were eating. And, you know, I just lied to my parents. Um. The hardest part was like sitting, having my cell phone taken. My friends took my cell phone, sitting in a gown. And like on a weekend at this hospital, there was no psych doctor to kind of evaluate you or talk to you. So they have to telepsych me in, teledoctor me in to talk to someone at another hospital. Um, Scary moment because you're sitting in a ER for like the entire night. No one's there to talk to you. And you're like, what are they going to do? And, you know, also I felt a lot of shame. Um, funny thing is I ran into a friend who I've never seen 
he worked at this hospital. It's like, oh, why are you here? I'm like, oh, great. Now he knows. <laughs> no shame. No shame, right? Um, and, you know, he took my x-rays and everything. He's like, why are you here, Anthony? Are you feeling all right? I'm like, oh, you know, just not feeling right, you know? I met some interesting people. I mean, I've met a couple of nurses who went through a lot of the things I went through. Um, and we had some interesting conversations about, like, life faith and having these thoughts and they gave me like extra cartons of orange juice because i was a nice patient um key one of being in a hospital be a good patient treat your nurses and doctors nice because then they will treat you well don't be an a-hole but i i just remember sitting there and it was just hard to sleep at night because you had people screaming on the left you had people screaming on the right and you could overhear people like in the er like screaming because they're there for physical reasons like people get into car crashes you know i was just sitting there because i just wanted to, to end my life um you know my parents eventually found out that you know my, i had told my sister what was going on she's on the medical field of the spectrum she she kind of was taken aback from it she's like uh okay i never knew about this you know why haven't you told me what's going on and she told my parents my parents would come and visit me like the next day and it was so hard because my parents my parents now know Oh, great. The world. The world's ending. <laughs> like that was more shameful than anything else? Yeah, I think that was the most shameful thing I did. Like, oh, crap, my parents know I'm in the hospital. Um, my parents took it differently than I expected. They were sad that I was going through something they couldn't fully understand or comprehend or try to help um, with or, or even grasp. Because for them, it was like, oh, we don't know what, what, what Anthony's going through and we can't help him. What can we do? So I think I cried a lot telling my parents. And it was very hard. I don't think my parents fully understand still. Um, and how did they respond while you were crying? I think they were very embraceive. I think my dad cried. My mom cried. It was weird. Um, it was kind of this like weird moment. You know, the stereotype of Asian parents being all like stiff and cold and stuff. Um, it, it was different to see their reaction. The hard part was now what's next? Because eventually, you know, I was like, either going to be admitted somewhere or, like, get help, right? Because I voluntarily went to get help, right? Right. And when was this again? This was, like, last year in the summer, um, in August. In the summer, that's right. Yeah, so I get to leave the ER. I spent, like, three days in the ER. I learned the way of sleeping through screaming people and everything. I eventually was able to go start counseling again. And it was my second time going through counseling. It was strange because you felt like you're a marked person now because you got you went to the hospital for having suicidal ideation. You just felt like there's this label on you and you can't get out of that, you know. So it's hard. It was really hard. I was like, I, I could go on my own. My parents went with me on my first day. I was like, it's fine. Just go. I'm going to be here for, for, you know, X amount of time. And I went through counseling, trying to navigate a lot of the stuff that happened in the past two years, right? At that point, I, I was still wrestling with, so now what? What what does the future hold? What am I going to do about my life? I still don't have a job. Life is just on seesaws or like, it's just, it feels like it's always teetering to the brink of like oblivion. And so as I'm slowly recovering for me, it's like, okay, it seems like things are slowly getting better. And then the last and final thing for 2019, the icing on the cake was losing my car. For me, having a car was freedom for me to travel and to, to do things. And so my car was totaled and it felt like I lost everything. How did it get totaled? Uh, a drunk driver decided to plow into my car while I was asleep at night. I decided to plow into a bunch of cars and my car was part of the damage he caused. Um, so, oh my gosh. So I lost my car. I felt like I lost everything. Job, relationship, now car. Next thing you know, you're like, oh, I'm going to lose my house, right? So coming into 2020, I was like, I went through hell in 2019. And my thought was, okay, 2020, I just want to get through 2020. And, you know, there's no commitment to get better on 2020. 2020 is going to be an amazing year. My plan was like 2020, just get through it. Just survive and everything could be okay. But that was like the past two years. That's that's my story. <laughs> yeah, no, Anthony, thank you so much for sharing that. It just sounds immense, everything that you've been through. When it comes to some of the specific moments that you experience, like 
the shame that you felt when your parents came and also when you bumped into your friend? Do you still carry that with you? I feel like I still am in a, a phase of processing a lot of my shame, a lot of the guilt, because it doesn't go away that easily. I don't think they don't leave like magically because you just wish them away or anything. They're always there. I think about everything as a story, as a collaborative being a history major, I had a really good memory of things. So everything replays itself like a movie. So it's very hard to forget those feelings. And so 2020 hasn't made it easier for me. Do you find it helpful to replay the tape or is it not helpful? I think one thing that was helpful for me in the early parts was diving back into the trauma. You wrestle with all the feelings, but also you come back out. So it's not like you go fully in and just stay in it, but you somehow come back out. Um, you replay it, you remember all those feelings, but then you remember why you felt the way you felt. What has been helpful is like finding a way to express myself. Art, art is a, a way for me to express myself. There are definitely days where I just don't do anything. I just sit and do nothing. Or I just go out for a long run, a really long run, and I try to not think about things that are too difficult. Those are some things that I've found helpful the past year or so. Investing in certain things or like try new things that I don't normally try. So That's awesome. In, in terms of the support that you had, were you able to talk to friends about what you were going through or was that also challenging? It was definitely hard because how do you tell someone you're going through this? Because there's always this kind of guilt and shame. I don't think it has gotten easier to tell people like, hey, I am depressed or something. Because for anyone who's dealing with this, you know that people won't fully understand you. And that's hard. And that's something I have to live with every day, knowing that friend A will never fully understand what that feeling is like. You have to risk being misunderstood. Yeah, it's that big risk, and you have to be okay with it and live with it. And it's not your fault that they don't understand, because it's never your fault. That has been something I, I deal with, but when I was healthy emotionally, I always had this plan. One was to have my life. One was to kind of like try to save my life. I should have a safety net or something in the background if in case this happens. And so I made friends with people who I thought would be safe to share with these things because not a lot of people would be, be understanding or like be able to take it in, you know? And so that's how I kind of approached it. Yeah. Do you have any advice for people who want to become safe or who want to support their friends who are working through depression and suicidal ideation? I think one thing for those who are going through the sheer darkness, I think the one thing is at the end of the day, it's okay to not be okay. You know, you don't have to have it all figured out. The misconception we have is that healing should just happen right then and there, but healing is a long process of navigating through like a lot of things and you can't fully get there. There's hope, I think. The hardest part is when you're at that low point, you feel like there is no hope. There is no way to grasp hope. And it's hard. What you want people to understand for someone who's been battling this for a long time is that, you know, your life is important. Speaking of myself, I had a hard time thinking my life was important. And for anyone dealing with depression, I remember how long it took for me to feel like, oh, my life is significant in some way. To a point where maybe one day I could tell myself, like, okay, my life is worth something. There are going to be days where I felt like shit. But there are those tiny moments where life, life gets a little easier. Where the embrace of a hug feels like a, a kind of a, a spark. Or where it's worth waking up to see the stars the next night. Or worth seeing the sunrise the next day. Or like embracing laughter. Because sometimes you don't really appreciate the small things as much. When you're going through a lot of darkness, it's very hard to kind of see the small stuff because you're carrying so much. My advice is grasp onto the small things and know that as human beings, it's weird because we value strong people in society. But for some reason, we advocate for the underdogs, which is like 
weird in, in some sense. The weak always stay together. And it's, it's weird because you're taught at an early age that winning is the ultimate goal of doing things in, in sports or in games. But if you're not willing to face defeat or you even like in, embrace the defeat, it's hard. I have never heard that life is easy. Life, life is hard. It's, it's okay to sit and do nothing some days. And it's fine if you don't have it right now. You know, it's fine to not be where you want to be. There's always an opportunity for us to heal. I think it's hard for, our, for someone who has depression. It feels like vines and thorns are slowly crushing you and you're losing and you can't, you can't breathe. And sometimes those vines slowly lessen and then you can breathe again. But it's not just a one hit wonder where if you take medication or you get counseling, it's this long, arduous journey of attacking something like physical, like ailments, like cancer or something. You, you attack cancer like 10 different ways. But in terms of mental health, most people just think this is the only way to do it. But you can't attack something with just one mindset. You have to think about like all these other things. It is like a game of chess in some way. You have to find people that really care about you, who want to not give up on you. Because I think there are people in, in, in most people's lives that don't want to give up on that person. Because at the end of the day, I don't think anyone who lost someone in their life feel like, oh, I'm grateful that so-and-so passed away. You need to have people in your ring that want to be there, that want to see you get better. And that's going to take a while because not a lot of your friends will fully understand what you when you first share. Because they'll probably be like, oh, just go to counseling, just get meds or whatever, right? No, your friends will need to fully take steps to fully understand of being with you on the ground level. And, and my advice for friends who want to work with a friend who's going through these things, it's the most basic thing anyone has given is like, listen and be there. But the hard part is how do you be there for someone who's going through this? Because a lot of people have this very like, oh yeah, I just listen. But like, there's so much time and investment in listening to someone going through depression because it's not just like come and go. It may take years. And are you willing to kind of years of doing this? Because there's a sacrifice to it. You know, are you willing to sacrifice time? Because depression doesn't just go. Sometimes it's going to come back. And so my advice for people is, one, listen and listen well. Learning how to listen is, is a key. Number two would be showing up. I think the hard part is knowing how to show up for your friends. Sometimes it means going on a late run with your friend to get ice cream or something. And number three would be learn, not just asking questions to your friend, because it takes a lot of energy for anyone who's depressed, wrestle with suicidal ideation to kind of like, okay, I, I'm willing to just share because like straight up, they're not. <laughs> One thing is, it probably takes them like more energy to just share with you like, oh, I'm, I'm going through this. And you're like, oh, okay, I got you. I got you, friend. I'm your I'm, I'm your bro or I'm your I'm your sis or whatever. But it doesn't go that way. And I think that's that's some things I've thought about in terms of advice. I mean, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. There's a lot of little nuggets there. What I got was like that depression is, is for the long haul and for friends who want to be safe, places for people in their life who might also be going through that to look at it from the long, long view and to stick it out for the long term. So, Anthony, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Is there anything that you've shared you want to revisit? I think this is good. I felt like I got everything through. I thank you, Carl, for inviting me to share with everyone who listens to this podcast uh, about what, what it's like to go through these things. So I appreciate you inviting me on the show. And so, Absolutely, yeah. Anthony, love, love to hear your story. And thanks so much for being so brave and honest with us. Hope to talk to you again soon. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to the Misfortune Cookies podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast, please share it with your friends. Subscribe or give us a follow. Also, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions, comments, or you would like to share your story with us, send us an email at misfortunecookiespodcast at gmail.com. Bye.